good afternoon and hello and welcome to everybody, hopefully all over the world, um, to our uh, ISPD nursing webinar. This has been organised by the ISPD nursing committee. Um, it's for all professionals, but obviously we want to encourage lots of nurses to attend. So very welcome. We've got four great speakers uh, for this afternoon. And we're going to hear some varied experiences from from different parts of the globe and um, but to start us off uh, we've got joanne newman from the usa who's going to be talking about pd prescription so to set the scene uh, for the rest of the afternoon and um, just some housekeeping and um, obviously it's a virtual event and um, we'll try our best to keep it free from technical difficulties uh, but we will be recording it so that it can be available on the ispd website and um, so welcome to everybody and i'm going to hand over to joanna uh, and just to say if you've got any questions put them in the q a uh, of the on the screen thank you very much thanks joe thank you for the organization to invite me to speak about adapting the regimen to the individual pd and the learning objective for the whole presentation we want to introduce the basic for prescribing pd and then we have a few presenters that talk about um, nurses, PD, PD work through the work of nurses around the world. And then we also want to talk about uh, ISPD new approach to increase nurse participation. So peritoneal dialysis, I think to a lot of you, this is not new, okay? But just a very quick introduction. PD is one of the renal replacement therapies for patients who have end-stage kidney disease. And then this dialysis is performed by using the patient's own peritoneal cavity. In the access is a PD catheter that get placed surgically. And then on the catheter, there are Dacron cuffs and that will promote tissue ingrowth. So the catheter will stay in place. It's not like glasses or dentures that you put on and take off. And then sterile solution get infused into the peritoneum through this catheter and then dwell. During the dwell, that's when the blood cleaning happens. So how about the physiology of peritoneal dialysis? Now, solid moves bidirectionally between the peritoneal cavity blood, capillary blood, and the peritoneal cavity. And then inside the cavity is filled with the dialysate. And then this happens mainly by diffusion and a little bit by convection so the blood get clean. How about ultrafiltration? Ultrafiltration is through osmosis. And then most of the dialysis solution for PD is dextrose solution. And so dextrose is one of the osmotic agent. For those country that has icodextrin, which is a water soluble glucose polymer is a colloid, colloidal osmotic agent. And then the membrane permeability will affect diffusion convection and ultrafiltration. A peritoneal equilibration test is done to evaluate the membrane transfer rate, and I'm going to briefly talk about it later. So this is important. The basics for P prescribing PD, what are the prescribing elements? Fill volume, dwell time, number of exchanges or cycles, solution strength, total 24 hours dialysate volume, the patient's dry weight, whether the patient is doing CAPD or CCPD. But then there are some other factors also. The membrane permeability. Once we do the PET test, we will be able to find out if the membrane is fast, fast average, slow average, or slow. You know, in the old days, when the PET test get, first get developed, um, we used to use the term high, high average, low, and slow. But recently, we changed it to fast and slow. And of course, we need to consider the patient's residual kidney function and then the patient's dry weight, or if for some obese patient, we can use the patient's adjusted body weight. Now, the type of solution, and in different country, the glucose concentration representation is a little bit different. And then we have 1.5 or 1.36 and so forth. For the non-glucose-based solution, we have extranil, which is a icodextrin or neutrinil but then it really is subject to availability in different countries. So now talk about the PET test, peritoneal equilibration test. It's developed by Dr. Dodorsky. And this test is to define the membrane transport characteristic 
by measuring urea, creatinine, and glucose at different time. And then we compare that with the plasma. So when we get a standardized dwell time of four hours, we get the dialysate, say creatinine, compared with the plasma creatinine that was drawn at two hours. And then this is the look of a PET curve. When you see that, we will know that this is talking about PET. So I'm going to go through the next slide to talk about um, how to interpret that. Now, let's look at two different patients. Patient A at zero hour, meaning when the fluid got barely infused in, we take it out and take a sample. And then patient's dialysate creatinine was 0 0.1. Makes sense because it just barely hit the membrane. And then at two hours, the plasma creatinine was 9.46. And then at four hours, more creatinine got diffused, got cleared. So the measurement is 7.1. And then we call the DP ratio is 0.75. Versus patient B at zero hours, still the same, 0 0.1. At four hours, 6.1. And then the DP ratio is 0 0.64. So we can tell that patient A membrane is faster because at four hours, more creatinine get clear. Then the higher the ratio at four hours, the faster the transport because more creatinine get diffused. Now let's take a look at the glucose level. For patient A, at zero hour, when we measure the dextrose, the glucose level is 2,074. At four hours, it's 634. If you ask, how come it's low? Because some of the glucose get diffused into the bloodstream meaning we absorb the glucose. And then patient B at four hour, the glucose is 1000. So in this case, the patient A membrane is faster because more glucose get diffused from the dialysate into the bloodstream. So when we do the PET test, one thing that we have to remember, meticulous timing and then collection procedure is crucial to get the accurate result. Now, let's look at different uh, membrane type and solid clearance and ultrafiltration. So we have four different category, right? Fast, fast average, slow average, and slow. So with fast membrane, fast transporter needs shorter dwell time to avoid fluid reabsorption. While so slow transporter need longer dwell time to allow solid to transfer. So more shorter dwells with faster membrane will be needed to prevent negative ultrafiltration. Sometimes people will need, even need dry period if the patient has good residual kidney function. If not, then we can use icodextrin for longer dwell time. Versus when the patient has slow membrane, we need longer dwell time for solid transport. And then this is the peak ultrafiltration for different dextrose and different membrane type. Now let's talk about sodium sieving. This is another very important element when we do prescribe PD. Shorter dwell time will lead to increased sodium, serum sodium because, um, the, because of sodium sieving. And then when the serum sodium is higher, the patient will get more thirsty. In the peritoneal membrane, we have these aquaborin channel that will allow only water to pass through from the blood to the dialysate, in particular during the first hour of the dwell. So what happened when water leaves the blood, the sodium got left behind and then patient serum sodium is higher. So sodium diffusion increases only after two hours of dwell. And sometimes sodium sieving can even continue beyond two hours into the dwell, depends on the membrane transport. So too short of a dwell can cause sodium sieving and thus leading patient to feel thirsty. So when determining dwell time, sodium removal is very important. Too long or too short dwell time can cause inefficient sodium removal. So how can we solve this problem? By using icodextrin? or doing extra day exchange, and then longer nocturnal dwell time will also help to remove sodium. 
individual field volume prescription, we can use it based on the patient's weight. And these are some example. And some other, exam, some other factors will be the patient's residual kidney function, the patient's tolerance. But please don't ask, especially when the patient is new to dialysis and you ask them, do you feel full? What do you think they will do? They quickly feel the tummy and say, oh yeah, I feel full. Of course, you know, they might feel full because this is something new to them. Just watch the facial expression. If they have kind of frowning, you say, hey, what happened? Are you okay? Maybe they just have constipation or gas pain, who knows? Okay, and then the availability of the manual size bag. And then for APD, it's a little bit more flexible. The fill volume can be adjusted from as low as 100, ml, 500 ml, or 1,000 cc, 1,000 ml. Okay, type of therapy. We have CAPD, CCPD. CAPD is the manual exchange. Usually we, patients do it three to four times a day. And fill volume is about 2,000 to 2,005. And then there are some manual bag available uh, up to 3,000 cc. And depends on the patient's surface, body surface area. And then for the four exchanges a day, the dwell time usually is about four to eight hours and patient usually sleep through the longest dwell. For CCPD or APD, exchanges is performed by using an automated machine and about three to five cycles plus or minus last fill. And the last fill is the longest dwell. And total cycle time is about eight to 12 hours. Dwell time for each cycle is around one and a half to three hours. And therapy usually is performed when the patient is sleeping, multitasking, and then may be able to use larger field volume when the patient is in supine position because um, it's easier to tolerate. Tidal therapy, what is this? We use a cycler to perform PD exchanges with the dwell volume never really get completely empty. And then why do we want to use it? Usually we use it for patients that have fast membrane it's because when the membrane is fast type, we need to do a lot more exchanges to prevent fluid absor absorption. And then uh, with shorter cycle, we will waste a lot of time for fill and drain. But if we leave the membrane half full, half empty, it's never dry. So we'll con have continuous clearance. And then we'll also have fresh osmotic agent. And then by leaving some of the solution in, sometimes we can help the poorly draining catheter. So we're not wasting a lot of time to try to drain all the fluid out and leaving the patient dry. And then when patient has some drain pain or dry pain, when the cycler is um, close to draining until the peritoneum is empty, the drain pain can happen due to siphonage. So by leaving some behind also helps to minimize the pain. But then we have to be very careful, watch for overfill. Now, CAPD or CCPD, what is better? We must put patient's lifestyle first. We need to do shared decision making. And then we also need to understand the patient's sleep habit. Some patients might not be able to sleep if they are connected to a machine. Of course, we need to look at patient residual kidney function, the PET result. Uh, the cycler uh, availability, some countries might not be that easily available. Constant power supply, in order to operate the cycler, we have to have power supply. Michaels and the team had done a study on adequacy of dialysis, and the conclusion is no differences in quality of life between patients starting on CAPD versus APD. So we need to consider the patient's preference and the lifestyle. For incremental dialysis, one of my colleagues is going to talk about it later. Now, this is important points to consider when we prescribe PD. We need to consider volume management and sodium removal. With good sodium removal, we will have better fluid control. Target urea clearance should be at least weekly KT overview of 1.7. And then we need to consider the membrane permeability when we do the PET test, we must remember to not to do it too early. We have to do it four to six weeks after the therapy started, because during the first month, the peritoneum is still in the inflammatory state. And then we must include the residual kidney function when we make the adjustment. When the patient's residual kidney function drops, we need to increase the dialysis and we have to have some expectation when we start the patient on PD and explain to them. 
And of course, we need to periodically monitor patient PD adequacy and also watch out for uremic symptoms. Now, 2022 January, ISPD practice recommendation talk about prescribing high quality goal directed PD. I strongly recommend all of you to go onto the website and read about the detail. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. That was a fantastic start. Um, really set the scene and gave us an in-depth view of, of how we prescribe in, in PD. So we're going to move over to a different part of the world now, to the Lebanon, and hear from Hanida, some experience of PD and how we manage PD in the Lebanon. So over to you, Hanida. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for ISPD for allowing me to start to, to talk about the peritoneal dialysis in Lebanon. <clears throat> so this is my uh, outline. Uh, I'll be uh, briefly uh, uh, talk about the kidney disease in Lebanon, and then I'll go about uh, in in brief uh, about the uh, case the case study, and I will discuss the challenges and the future uh, of peritoneal dialysis in, in Lebanon. So uh, this is Lebanon. These are a few pictures from Lebanon. For those who don't know Lebanon, it's a small country located in the Middle East. It's uh, very well known for its uh, rich culture, heritage, and the uh, natural beauty. Uh, its capital is Beirut. It's a cosmopolitan city. And, the, and it's a home for uh, to a mix of different culture. Uh, despite the beauty, Lebanon has faced significant challenges over the years. Among these challenges, the availability of peritoneal dialysis as a treatment option for patients who are suffering from a end stage renal disease. Uh, in Lebanon, the prevalence uh, of kidney disease is around 1,000 cases per, per million population. The incidence of end-stage renal disease is around 84 cases per, per million population per year. It's, it's almost the same uh, as the country around, uh, similar to the other country in the region. Uh, mainly the main causes of uh, kidney disease in Lebanon uh, um, it's, it's the, almost the same like, like everybody. It's like hypertension, diabetes, glomerulonephritis, and definitely other causes like polycystic kidney disease and other uh, problems. Uh, PD was first introduced in Lebanon in 1980s. At that time, there, was, uh, a, uh, there were a very limited number of dialysis centers, and the patients who required the uh, dialysis, they had to travel long distance to receive the treatment. So uh, uh, in, in brief, the peritoneal dialysis at the, uh, accounted for around 5% of all dialysis treatment in Lebanon. It's a small number comparing to, uh, to our population. The active number of uh, patients on PD is around 200 patients uh, on peritoneal dialysis. Uh, as we all know, all patients, they are candidate uh, for both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And this is where the patient should be given the option and the opportunities uh, to decide which, uh, which uh, modalities he has to choose. He has to be, to, be given, uh, to, be, uh, to be given all the pros and the cons, and then he has to be able and be helped to, uh, to take the right uh, decision. Uh, nurses play a very crucial role in this uh, in this uh, uh, part in helping the patients to take the right decision as uh, in a shared fashion. So adapting peritoneal dialysis uh, uh, for the individual, it's very important to be uh, to to take to make the uh, protocol or to make the uh, uh, prescription so individualized for our patients. Whenever we're doing that, we have to take into consideration the age, comorbidities, personal and system resources, access limitation, infrastructure like electricity, uh, transportation, reimbursement policy, which is a problem here in Lebanon, and residual kidney function for for sure. Uh, a small case study, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. FR, she's a 72 years old uh, woman. She's a housewife, diabetic, hypertensive. She has a kidney disease with a, a GFR of less than, tw uh, less than 10. Uh, she also has a heart failure with ejection fraction of 30%. She was admitted to the hospital for pul pulmonary edema. 
and directly she was started on hemodialysis. Although PD was discussed as an option with her attending, but because of the severity of her cases, we, we had to start her directly on hemodialysis. At that time, we inserted, uh, we started the hemodialysis uh, through IJ. Uh, all through the dialysis period, we, we faced uh, multiple uh, problems with the hair vascular access. Uh, beside the blood pressure, uh, all the time she was having a, a blood pressure at, uh, on the low side. Uh, uh, to prevent, uh, to, uh, we, were, we were, the nurses in the dialysis unit were very careful to prevent uh, any infection for her uh, permanent catheter. Uh, uh, the dialysis, the hemodialysis, uh, 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 she was kept on hemodialysis until she was stabilized medically. And then the, uh, the issue of uh, PD was discussed again. The patient was open for, uh, for PD and it was a very good option for her, for her age and her, uh, for her problem also regarding the transplant. Transportation. Um, we we had also to to make sure not to remove an extra fluid just to to uh, we to maintain her renal kidney function. Also because because of uh, uh, preserving her kidney function, we had we we were uh, we had to be very careful and not to providing her and administering an antibiotics. Uh, uh, that's why we had to uh, treat or to handle the IJ. Uh, very carefully uh, in order not to lose the momentum so we directly uh, started talking about the pd and we were we were all the time uh, uh, discussing the pd with the patient just to to uh, to keep her active and willing to shift into a pd PD catheter was inserted and uh, she started on, on uh, peritoneal dialysis on APD uh, and she was doing very well with a very accurate uh, UF and she was living her life uh, uh, perfectly. Despite, uh, despite the, uh, the happy ending, we faced multiple challenges in shifting to PD. So she's a, she's a one case uh, among others uh, for uh, in patients in uh, Lebanon uh, for those who, who would like to shift uh, to PD. Uh, uh, mainly, the challenges, as, as shown in this uh, slide, the Lebanese healthcare crisis, uh, as as it is shown in the in the picture here, Lebanon has passed through a multiple uh, multiple crisis since uh, 2019 until till the, the the this time uh, regarding the uh, uh, Beirut blast and the economic uh, the uh, economic crisis. So the, this this crisis affect hugely affect the uh, the medical. Uh, um, medical sector uh, uh, because of this uh, crisis we had uh, we had to lose uh, uh, multiple uh, many doctors they had to uh, to leave uh, lebanon and nurses actually to leave to, uh, leave lebanon to to another countries and that that uh, uh, created a huge uh, uh, bulk over the, the nurses who, who are still working here in Lebanon. The other uh, issue, limited resources, or because be, uh, the, uh, and the availability of the PD centers, because of this crisis, we, were, uh, we had uh, multiple uh, problems in providing and uh, bringing the uh, uh, supplies, the available supplies uh, to, to Lebanon. Uh, and the, the, this, is, this, this will lead us to the third part, which is the availability of of supplies uh, because the material that is needed for the peritoneal dialysis were interrupted and that led to uh, decrease in the frequency of uh, dialysis and uh, uh, that will uh, that definitely affected the patient's situation lack of awareness and the phys physician bias uh, yes it is one of the major uh, crisis uh, major challenges here in lebanon uh, we have a, a huge percentage of uh, nephrologists who are not available, who are not aware about the uh, PD, and they, they don't like PD in a way uh, for a multiple reason. Either they, because they were not exposed to a patient uh, to PD, uh, uh, to PD and patient preferences, and because of their bias, because financially here in Lebanon they don't, they are not getting reimbursed for those patients uh, anytime they start patients on PD, and this is an issue actually. The education, the education it involves both the nurses and the, the physician, they are not so much educated and the PD, it's not, uh, it's not incorporated in the curriculum uh, uh, for the, uh, during their education. Uh, as for the cost, uh, 
the the, the patients who go to a peritoneal dialysis, the, he has to pay part of the uh, uh, cost. Uh, be, uh, wherever the uh, uh, on the other side, where uh, hemodialysis is 100% covered by the government, the peritoneal dialysis, the patient has to pay part of the uh, uh, finance out of his pocket, which is also a, a challenge. Follow up care. Uh, this is the this is where the patient he has to follow up frequently to to come to the physician to his clinic. And this is a problem, when, uh, especially if the patient is living outside Beirut and outside the, uh, the uh, central area. Uh, multiple efforts uh, are being done here in Lebanon to improve the peritoneal dialysis and to be uh, to be uh, to make it available and access for every patient. So a multiple education and awareness campaign is being done here for patients, uh, for patients, for the family, and for nurses as well. In our center here, the nurses they are taking the lead in educating the patients. The nurses definitely they. They were uh, they were uh, given the educational material about the PD and the physician. They're very supportive. Uh, a training program, uh, uh, multiple training sessions were were done for the nurses, for the physician as well, uh, uh, like a workshop for catheter insertion. And we're coordinating uh, with this uh, with the uh, uh, centralized. Um, a company to educate the patient and to train the patients. Governmental support, uh, the, the, uh, the efforts to, to, to ask the government to help those patients and to make it, uh, to, to decrease the uh, bulk or the financial bulk on the patient is, is always, always being done. And also to provide or to give the physician a certain percentage. So that uh, maybe this will encourage them to, uh, uh, to educate the patient about PD or to shift patients into a peritoneal dialysis. Uh, definitely, whenever the physician, they are aware and they are uh, into a peritoneal dialysis, uh, the establishment of PD centers will definitely will increase and the patient will have uh, the option uh, to, uh, to choose between the hemodialysis and the peritoneal dialysis. The collaboration with the international organization, this is uh, this is uh, uh, like an ISPD. Uh, it's it's being so help, uh, helpful to improve the access to PD in Lebanon. Uh, we are taking from the ISPD, for example, the educational resources, the training program, and the expert consultation uh, for the healthcare uh, providers in, in Lebanon. Uh, this is my last uh, slide as a conclusion by adapting peritoneal dialysis regimen to the individual patient and healthcare provider. Definitely, it will improve the effectiveness of treatment and would reduce the complication and definitely the patient satisfaction. It's very important to work collaboratively with the patient uh, as a personalized treatment. And despite all the challenges, definitely we have to uh, work hard uh, to make the PD available for all these patients and make it and uh, a very effective option. Whenever we're discussing it, uh, we have to make it effective for this patient. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you have any question, I'm, I'm ready. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Hanida. And I think um, that was just a really good demonstration of actually the, the effort and challenges and the important role that nurses do play actually just with your case study and everything that you've been trying to do just to increase the PD and and it does take a lot of effort and time so and um, thanks for that and sharing the challenges and um, so we're now moving over to the UK to Sally who's going to talk to us about incremental PD so um, you know slightly different approach to um, delivering PD therapy so I'm going to hand over to you, Sally, and thank you. Good day, everyone. Thank you very much, Helen, for this opportunity. Um, uh, my name is Sally Punzelen. I'm the head nurse for Renal Home Therapies, and I'm based here in London. Um, I will be talking about um, adapting the regime to the individual patient, uh, more about incremental PD, uh, which is our center um, experience, and some case presentations some disclosures from my part. So um, we've actually done a study um, with uh, in relation to incremental PD prescription. And this was done in our center by one of our um, doctors uh, in collaboration uh, with the rest, with the other doctors and myself. Um, and it's called Supporting Individualized Shared Care Decision-Making in Incremental Dialysis. Um, took part in the latter 2019-2020. Um, 
Um, and also where we practice incremental PD is being underpinned by um, some initiatives. Um, firstly, by the Get It Right uh, for the First Time, GERFT, uh, Renal Medicine, which is a, a report that was released in March 2021, which says that um, ensures or would like to ensure that um, home therapy is promoted and offered um, for all those that are suitable to dialyze, for all patients, I mean, that who are suitable to dialyze. Um, and this was from GERF 2021. And along with this initiative, obviously, is a chance um, having to use or having incremental PD um, available and as well as assisted PD. Um, this again is underpinned from the um, study that uh, we all had uh, partake on um, called availability of assisted PD in Europe, uh, call for increased and equal access. So the main um, note or message on that study is the availability of the service of the assisted PD in that instance, um, which offers um, PD or home therapies um, uh, as an opportunity and increased access of it to dialyze at home for those uh, who are increasingly fail and older patients with established kidney failure. So uh, we are in a way um, have a good opportunity in, in London or in UK because we have the following services of assisted PD and at the same time practicing incremental PD, we are able to uh, promote PD to a wider population, i.e. with the frail and elderly. Um, not only that, but also to our patients who have um, um, learning disabilities and those who are also having um, their family carers or family members having to do their dialysis for them. Um, so the presence of incremental PD is of much advantage to them. So what is incremental PD prescription? It is actually um, by CAPD, an initial prescription of two to three CAPD exchanges, which is done five to six days a week. Um, when we refer it to APD, it means that the initial prescription is with uh, the patient is given a day off or um, there is no uh, daytime exchange. So mainly the patient is just doing the APD machine at night. Um, this is obviously dependent on the residual kidney function of our patients. Um, there's several criteria uh, like that we would want to consider where the patient may fit um, either on a CAPD or APD regime. Um, important question is how it will fit to their lifestyle. Um, and of course, the presence of shared decision making as this will uh, involve the patients and or their families and carers uh, moving forward. And we consider and assess our patients' well being. Quality of life is obviously being considered the highest. And along that, uh, like everyone else, we review our blood test results, the urine output, um, and some clearance tests that we routinely do to our patients. So, moving on, some case presentations. Uh, this, um, the names are obviously changed. And uh, let's take for our first case, Miss Sam, Sam Caddles. Um, she's on her 40s. Uh, she's a female uh, above 115 kilograms. She's a mother of young children. Um, mainly there's four children and all under the age of 18. She started PD in March, 2022. And she was placed on a yellow, yellow, green uh, for six days CAPD prescription initially. For six, after six months of starting in this prescription, uh, we've noticed that there's some swollen or some swelling in her ankles. And so we've started her on uh, the use of extra kneel bag or icodextrin of two, um, in two days of a week. Um, and after that, in 12 months time, uh, she's still on PD and is she still on the same regimen? Um, and this is her figures. So if you can see, she's still um, having her um, EGFR kept to eight and nine uh, with her creatinine clearance and KT over V still well above um, as what we've expected or what we would like it to be. 
Moving on, um, I've called the, our next case as uh, Nanny McPhee, and she's on her mid 40s. She's female and over 90 kilograms in weight. She mostly stays at home, and basically her activities is mostly just to help looking um, after the child of her friend. She started PD in August 2021, and her initial prescription was a yellow-green uh, for five days in a week, she, so she has two days off. Um, immediately a week or two after we've seen her, after she started PD, she said that she felt better um, immediately. And eight months down the line, she was able to go out on short holiday with friends. Uh, she would actually go on horse riding and other activities, which she felt she has not done um, weeks or months before she started to become a symptomatic with her renal failure. Unfortunately, um, Nanny McPhee had developed some headaches and speech difficulties, wherein obviously it showed up some signs of having a stroke or CVA uh, months down the line. However, she was recovering very well, or she recovered well rather, because after a year, she was increased to six days. Um, and the only change that we've given her is that she was using one icodextrin uh, one day in a week. So she's still on a transplant waiting list and she's thriving on PD as we speak. So that is her figures as we monitor her on her day regular clearances uh, and bloods and, and uh, residual renal function. Um, and last but not the least, my Mr. Groovies is in his 80s. He's a male, 70 kilogram, um, and his diabetic nephropathy um, has a history of cancer. He's a retired musician, and he started PD with us in December 2022. He was started on yellow, pink, or icodextrin for six days in a week, so he's got a day off. And again, he said to us that he felt usually much better since she, he started PD, that he started to play music again, um, a gig which he was very, very proud of because, again, he was not able to play um, because he has felt very unwell um, since uh, before or before starting PD. And this is his figures as, uh, as to date. So I think with the cases that we have, we it clearly has shown that our doctors and PD nurses work together to help set our patient expectations. So we try and tend to sit down and sit with um, and talk to our patients um, what incremental PD prescription is, what we felt is is uh, much will fit to their lifestyle, and. There is obviously uh, an evidence of individualized shared decision making from even from the start of the analysis. We felt that there, by doing this, there is an increasing acceptance. Um, there is um, definitely increased uh, engagement from their part of their treatment, which is quite vital to home therapies. Um, as this leads to compliance uh, into their treatment. And when it comes to the point that we need to increment or to start to increase dialysis, it is easily achieved, we feel, because we have the collaboration and the cooperation of our patients. So it is as well a contributing factor to offer PD, as I've said from the start of my talk, um, thereby we have increased the uptake um, of home therapies as a whole. So just to conclude, um, we have been uh, from under recommendation and guidelines, uh, in a nutshell, in initial prescription is usually our CAPD to two to three exchanges in five days, five to six days a week, usually um, giving our patients some day, days off. Um, we would follow them up in clinic, either by us nurses or our doctors, and we look at our patient's well-being. We usually ask what symptoms may be present or has it improved since the start of dialysis. 
what is their volume status? Are they over, um, over hydrated or dehydrated? Are they fluid overload? How much did they get off uh, as an extra and how much they UF from the bags that they're using or how much they are retaining as well? We are looking into their biochemistry and to their blood test results on a regular basis. We obviously look at measures to, to as much as possible preserve the re residual renal function and measure it uh, on, on, on a regular interval and obviously do our clearance tests on a regular basis. At the end of that assessment, we obviously look at the question that if there's any concern for our individual patients and is there a merit for their dialysis to be actually changed in the beginning. So if the answer is no, no change is done to their prescription. And obviously a, an opportunity for us to discuss um, how the prescription might change is usually triggered when we note a marked or significant loss of their residual kidney, kidney function. However, if there is an identified need to increase or change the prescription, not necessarily increase, it may be decreased as well for, for their dialysis prescription, then there is shared decision making. Um, we talk to our patients and consider on ways of either increasing or decreasing PD prescription, um, considering or supporting their patients, uh, their person's um, lifestyle. And of course, we then determine the new prescription on CAPD. We either increase the number of exchanges or we increase the days in the week that they're doing their CAPD exchanges or decrease for that matter. And for APD, we may also increase the days um, up, to, uh, be up to being um, seven days in a week or the regime to increase the time that they're being on the machine or even add a tea time bag exchange or a CAPD exchange. And of course, whether we change or not their prescription, we always go back to the clinic review where we continuously assess and work with our patients from time and time while they are on PD. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thanks. Uh, Sally, that was really, really good. And um, I think really demonstrates several things, shared decision making, goal directed care, and really how um, I think incremental PD is really interesting. Um, I think we've probably all been doing it sort of for a long time, but not in such a, I think the way that you described it then in a very structured, organized and involving patients, um, I thought it's, it's really, really good. So thank you for that. So we're now um, zipping over to <laughs> zipping over to Kenya to welcome Grace for our last presentation, um, and just to see um, how very different and what the challenges are for PD for nurses in Kenya. So welcome Grace, and handing over to you. Thank you so much, Helen. It's an honor to be here. I really thank the ISPD for allowing me to share the role of the nephrology nurse in a resource restrained country, a Kenyan experience. And my name is Grace Wanjiko Ngaroya from Kenya in Africa. Now, um, I want to say that um, Kenya is a, a small country, uh, a developing country but uh, highly populated uh, with uh, 57 million people, out of which uh, 50 are living in the rural areas. The healthcare uh, uh, is mainly public, uh, but we also have uh, private um, healthcare that is non-profit making, mainly from the mission hospitals. And we are also having uh, private uh, healthcare providers that are there for profit. Uh, majority of the diseases that we are experiencing are uh, communicable diseases, for example, malaria, uh, which leads a lot to acute kidney injury, HIV, AIDS, TB, 
plus other non-communicable diseases, for example, hypertension, which is the leading cause of uh, kidney failure, and diabetes follows. So there is also high infant mortality, which is uh, actually improving. Sorry, I have a problem moving the slide. I don't know why, but uh, yeah. Yes, thank you so much for the uh, patience. Now I'm going to discuss about issues for kidney replacement therapy in Kenya. We have limited access to dialysis and uh, currently we have been approximately 5,670 patients that are undergoing uh, maintenance dialysis twice a week in our country, and they are all funded by the government of Kenya. We have low utilization of PD, where we have only three patients on maintenance uh, hemodialysis, and uh, uh, mainly the, the supplies come from Germany, and they are very, very expensive. We have shortage of specialized medical personnel, at the moment, uh, we have 43 adult nephrologists, five pediatric nephrologists. So about 10,000 people have kidney failure in Kenya requiring uh, dialysis, yet only 10% of those who need dialysis can access the services in Kenya. Now, uh, this is my personal journey. Uh, I applied for the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis and the International Society of uh, Nephrology Fellowship programs, where I spent a year in Madras Medical Mission Hospital in India, which is a, a teaching hospital with a major nephrology and home dialysis program. I had a lot of hands-on experience in all aspects of nephrology, especially home dialysis training and home visits. And you can see me there receiving um, uh, my certificates uh, from Mad uh, Ma Ma Madras uh, Medical Mission Hospital and the university attached and the uh, Professor George Abraham was my mentor. Now, I really want to appreciate the saving young lives also. Uh, as part of my journey, I was able to be trained by saving young lives and as we all know, saving young lives uh, is um, uh, uh, saving young lives is a program that was sub established in 2012 uh, in partnership between the International Society of Nephrology, International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis, and the International Pediatric Association. They, in collaboration with the Sustainable Kidney Foundation strove to develop sustainable programs in low and low middle income countries aimed at treating uh, patients, especially children with acute kidney injury, primarily with the use of uh, peritoneal dialysis. So uh, this is still uh, a journey that I took whereby the saving young lives, they were able to, uh, to take us for, for training and uh, we were two doctor, there were two doctors and the four nurses from Kenya that were invited uh, to a Saving Young Lives uh, training workshop in Cape Town, South Africa for three weeks. And uh, the areas uh, that we covered were hands-on PD catheter insertion uh, with the PD prescriptions for infants, children, and adults. And also we covered how to improvise PD with the catheters and also how to improvise uh, PD fluids. Uh, for example, we were taught how to use um, the nasogastric tubes and the central venous catheters and use of Hartmann's or Lingus lactate solution with the 50% dextrose. As you can see, we are there. We are in Cape Town with the team and also we had other other nurses and doctors from other African countries. 
So you can see me there being trained on how to insert catheters um, in, in South Africa, Cape Town, thanks Saving Young Lives team. Now, I am, I'm going to present two cases. A seven-year-old infant is A, referred from a mission hospital, and the history is that the patient refused to breastfeed. The, the, the baby had high fever with the zero urine output. And a diagnosis of uh, acute kidney injury was made. The attending doctor was not a nephrologist and there was, and they had no PD experience. So I was called to provide guidance. There was no PD catheter uh, available. And uh, the, the, the other hospitals where we could have transferred the patients uh, did not even have a PD catheter. It was a public holiday and even the companies did not have. And so I advised them that we can improvise with a central venous catheter. The infant's weight was uh, three kgs. So I used the, the saving young lives um, criteria, as you can see uh, in, the, in the reference there uh, by, uh, by all those specialists uh, that did the saving young lives guidelines. Uh, we were able to use that where the field volume was calculated uh, uh, according to 10 to 20 mils per kg. And, um, and also we were able to take the, the basic, whereby we took three, three kgs, so the higher, the, the higher volume of 20 mils, we multiplied by the, the weight of the baby and we got 60 mils. So we used the, the, the volume control uh, uh, equipment to be able to, to measure the, the 60 mls. So initially, we started with the flashes on and off to just make sure the catheter was working. And uh, we also flashed the CVC with the heparin acetylsalin. And uh, we started initially with a dwell time of five minutes and graduated to 30 minutes using 1.5% PD solution. Now, uh, I contacted the pediatric nephrologist because this hospital did not have a pediatric nephrologist. Actually, we fixed the CVC mainly with a general doctor, a medical officer. And as you can see uh, that photo, we are already uh, doing the dialysis there. And uh, uh, the management accepted to, to, to welcome this pediatric doctor and allow her to <clears throat> be able to continue with the management of the patient. Sadly, due to the overwhelming infection, the infant died after five days, but all the, the biochemistry, the, the urea creatinine had dropped down and the baby had started making urine. Now this is case B, whereby we had a nine-year-old baby referred from a health center with a history of rheumatic heart disease. The patient was admitted with pulmonary edema with the zero urine output, a diagnosis of acute kidney injury was made. The patient was transferred to the ICU and put on mechanical ventilation because of the fact that the patient was, was had really deteriorated. So again, the attending doctor was not a nephrologist and had the, literally no experience on peritoneal dialysis. So I still used the Saving Young Lives guidelines and they were, at least this time there was a PD card that are available. And uh, I used um, the, the PD Plus from Presenius Company to start the, the PD and, um, uh, and, uh, and used the, the, the Saving Young Lives guidelines. This time the weight of the baby was, was the child was 15 kilograms. So the in initial volume according to the formula of 10 to 20 mils per kg, we multiplied the 50 times 20 and um, we were able to get um, three, three, 300, uh, 300 uh, mils. And uh, we started uh, after flashing on and off, we started with the 30 minutes uh, uh, dwell with the 2.3 PD solution because of the pulmonary edema. Again, I conducted a pediatric nephrologist from another hospital and she was given permission to continue with the management of the patient. 
After eight days, the kidney function returned to normal and the PD catheter was removed. He was discharged home with a follow-up at the admitting hospital. Now, uh, I, I just want to say that uh, in Kenya to date, uh, we have been funded by the, uh, the Africa Development Bank through the Ministry of Health, where we, through East Africa Center of Excellence for Nephrology and Urology, we are able to, to now train from the year 2016, we have been training nephrologists and other experts. So personally, I'm, I'm charged in coordinating training of nephrology nurses from a higher diploma, master, fellowship, and PhD. All services are provided in the center of excellence where we have primary health care in, a, 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 in a kidney care, transplant, that is kidney transplant, peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, and the continuous uh, replacement therapy. So, uh, so far, these are the number of people um, that, uh, that we have trained. Uh, we have trained uh, 400 nephrologists. Uh, sorry, sorry, I went ahead there. We have trained 15 nephrologists. Pediatric nephrologists are five that are still in training. Higher diploma in nephrology in nursing, we have trained 197. Masters in nephrology nursing, seven. And PhD in nephrology nursing, one. I want to say, uh, to really emphasize and say that uh, before then, our, our specialists used to train out of the country, but now we are able to train. This is the projector, projection of the East Africa Kidney Institute. We are hoping to train 400 in five years, uh, nephrologists, pediatric nephrologists, 400, higher diploma, 400, masters, 160, PhD, 30, and fellowship, 200. And with this increased numbers and availability of solutions, we hope to increase numbers in PD. So this is the East Africa Kidney Institute, Center of Excellence for Urology, Nephrology and Urology, and it has an academic wing. The, the building is under construction. We are hoping to start the hospital that is for urology and the uh, academic wing, and also for nephrology by this year, October. I want to thank you so, so much. You are welcome to Kenya. You can see the many animals that we have. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Grace. What an invitation. Um, I'll let you just um, end, end the show. That was fantastic and um, really insightful for, for those of us that aren't from that part of the world. So um, huge challenges, but great amount of work that you've done. Um, so that's all our speakers now. So that draws our webinar to a close. Um, in the interest of time, we won't do a Q&A session now. If there's any questions, we, we will answer them to, to everybody. Um, so I just want to thank all the speakers and um, I'm sure you'll all agree it was really insightful and we hope to see you all again and many of you in our next nursing webinar. So thank you very much. Good afternoon.